Welcome everybody to the eighth of a series of MLA funded more beef from pasture webinars. My name's David Brown and I'm with Home Sackett and Home Sackett are the New South Wales State Coordinators of the More Beef and Pastures program. We're actually having another webinar next week for you guys. Uh, it's on Thursday at the same time, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And that webinar is going to be focusing on better beef marketing. Just before we get started this evening, I want to go a few items so you know how to participate in the webinar. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer in the upper right hand corner. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the text under the questions pane at the, con at the bottom of the control panel. You don't have to type your name in as the technology links this to the question. You may send your questions in at any time during the presentation. We'll collect these and address them at the end. With that in mind, may I ask everyone to uh, write their, you know, let us know by the, the questions box if they can hear us clearly or not. Yep, oh, great. We've got a few people coming through. Yep, all loud and clear. Thank you. It's good to know that you can hear us and that you know where to type your questions. Moving on, uh, as I said, tonight, tonight's webinar is fully funded by the MLA, uh, is fully funded by MLA through the More Beef and Pastures program. The aim of these webinars is to give you a taste of the type of information that's available through More Beef and Pastures. Much of the information is available in more detail in follow-up events where the aim is to improve knowledge and skills and ultimately change beef practices for the better. You have the option in the post-webinar survey to indicate what follow-up events you may be interested in, so please let us know. This slide shows a screenshot of the More Beef and Pastures online manual. The manual consists of seven modules, each of which is highlighted in the banner at the top of the screen. Tonight's webinar fits into the Wiener Throughput and Meeting Market Specifications module. Thanks for providing us with your production data as you registered for this webinar. At the end of the webinar, there will be a brief survey appear on your computer automatically, either as you shut the webinar platform or we close the webinar. It'll only take two or three minutes to complete. It'll only take two or three minutes to complete and we consider this information very important. We ask that you stay online to complete the survey before you rush off. This feedback is integral to the ongoing success of the More Beef from Pastures program and MLA uses the information to determine the success of events, what information is important for producers and how best we deliver it. So moving on, I'd like to introduce tonight's presenter. Hamish Dixon is the owner director of AgriPath Consulting and Hamish is a farm management consultant with particular expertise in ruminant nutrition. Unique in his independence, Hamish is 15 years into the ag industry and will provide a practical approach to beef cattle nutrition backed by a very strong theoretical knowledge. So to talk to us about nutrition and beef cattle, I'd like to introduce Hamish Dixon. So just bear with us a moment, guys, while we change and make Hamish's screen the presenter's screen. How are you going, Hamish? Can you hear us there? Yeah, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. You're online, Hamish, and uh, you're ready to take over. Okay, great. So you can see the screen there, no problems? Looks good, thank you. Perfect. All right, thanks, David. Look, firstly, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Everyone's pretty busy at this time of year, but it is great to see a strong interest in this area at the moment as well. Look, tonight we've got a fairly short period of time to discuss nutrition, so we're really going to go through the most important aspects. And some of those aspects that I'd like for you to be able to get out of tonight's webinar are really to have a good understanding of the primary nutrition drivers, what are the main nutrients that drive production, and then how do we use this information to sift through 
I guess the hundreds of supplementation options that quickly that are available and, and also to be able to work out how to quickly decipher what's right, what can be a waste of time and importantly what's going to provide a real return for your money. I guess in, in terms of some background, it is really important to have a good understanding of the nutrition principles and that's what allows you to really work out what's going to be the most cost effective feeding options for your cattle. Um, feed costs are a significant component of the operating cost, so it's often that even small changes in your nutritional management can have fairly big results on the bottom line. Also I think we often put a strong influence on improving the genetics of our herds, um, but we could also maybe look I guess at our nutritional management a little bit better. And how an animal performs is essentially a factor of its genetics and its environment. Within the environment component are aspects such as health, the season, but importantly nutrition. And if you look at many of the heritability figures for growth, fat, milk production and many of the reproductive traits, often only 20 to 30 percent of the variation in animals is due to genetics. And that means that often the rest of that is due to environment. So it is critical to ensure that stock receive good nutrition to fully express all the genetic gain that we've been making in our stock over the last little while. In terms of being able to really go through and understand what the different supplementary feeding options available to us can offer, it is really important, like I said, to, to understand really the real nuts and bolts of nutrition, to understand the, the core principles so that we can start to look through um, what value different products might offer us or not. There are many, many different products available on the, on the market. Some offer uh, supplements in terms of providing nutrition in terms of energy and protein and others quite often supply things like your minerals and vitamins. So there are a few different types of supplementary feeds that are available on the market and when we're talking about supplementary feeds tonight we'll generally be talking about um, the products that can be put out in the paddock for supplying energy and protein as well as minerals. We'll talk about them all together. One of the really core things that I want you to tonight is this, this main theory of looking at what is the primary limiting nutrient. That's one of the most simple and most effective ways of being able to determine whether a supplementary feed that you're looking at or you're being offered or whatever the story is, as to whether it's going to actually be able to offer you anything of value. What I often tend to see with a lot of the products that are on the market is they quite often target situations that won't necessarily provide you with the greatest return. Sure, in some circumstances they will give you a small gain in production, but the important thing and the most important thing in, in any of these sorts of assessments is making sure that you actually find what will give you the greatest bang for your buck. So tonight what we're really going to be going through are the steps around looking at what is available to the animals and then importantly how does that meet the animal requirements or not. So then we can really determine whether there's going to be a surplus in a particular area of nutrition or a deficit that needs to be addressed and then you can take the step of being able to look at whether it's cost effective to fill that gap or not. So this idea of, of the primary limiting nutrient which is essentially you know what's the most limiting factor in nutrition for these animals is a case of trying to find out what's holding back the whole system. Because as you see on the screen there, it might be that there's a particular deficiency in say protein supply and in this scenario really going out with some trace minerals on top of that are not going to turn the situation around. The biggest effect that you're going to be able to get in terms of improving the, productiv the productivity of those cattle is actually supplying protein in that situation. And you then might find that a different part of nutrition becomes a limiting impact and then you can make the second decision to say okay well is it worth pursuing that and going on to try and fix that area up as well. So if we start having a look at the requirements of the animals then it gives us a good gauge as to whether the feed that's in front of them is going to be adequate or not. And this is going to be a fairly brief overview because we can talk about, about ruminant physiology for, for, for a day, but one of the really important things that you need to understand is how the rumen functions and a lot of you should have a fairly reasonable understanding of that, but the important part is just to understand that really 
feeding the rumen is what we're all about. At the end of the day, the energy and the protein is effectively all driven by the rumen. Okay, our protein is, is driven by the microbes that are within that rumen environment, so bacteria, protozoa, and also those microbes are what produce the volatile fatty acids, which are our energy source for these, for these animals. So promoting a stable and healthy rumen environment is one of the best things that we can do in terms of improving animal productivity. In terms of actually trying to achieve a good rumen environment, some of the important aspects of that are ensuring that we supply enough energy and protein in there to keep the microbes growing and also that we have sufficient fibre coming into the diet for that healthy environment as well. The fibre is really critical in terms of actually maintaining um, ruminal contractions to help with the mixing of feed in that rumen, which actually helps with the digestion. And it's also really critical in terms of promoting chewing of the cud, okay, regurgitation of feed, which allows that secondary breakdown of the feed as it's chewed and broken down more. And importantly, with that chewing comes saliva production, which also helps ensure that we actually maintain a stable room and pH and a stable room and environment. So briefly, really the core thing is just to make sure that when we're actually looking at feeding the animal, we're aware of how that effect, what, what effect that might have on the rumen as well. When we start looking at some of the core parts of nutrition, some of the things that we're going to talk about are the aspects of dry matter intake, so how many kilos of feed an animal eats. We'll talk about energy and protein and then we'll touch on minerals and vitamins and those aspects as well. Now, the order in which I go through these things is actually quite deliberate. Okay, and this is the order of importance essentially of what is actually the main drivers of nutrition in there. But the water is obviously an, another component kind of nutrition. But after that, when we're really looking at nutrition, one of the core things is making sure that these animals can achieve reasonable intakes. And what we tend to find is that when feed is becoming going towards senescence, we see the digestibility figures are falling, fibre content, and particularly if you're looking at some of the quality figures on fibre, factors like the neutral detergent fibre measure, so NDF, that will increase and that tends to decrease the amount of feed that an animal can take in. Now, if that intake potential is severely reduced, then we know that we're going to have problems down the track in terms of simply achieving enough energy intake and protein intake off that pasture. So when there's often limitations with dry matter intake, we know that we've got to come back afterwards and make sure that we can actually supplement to ensure that energy and protein intakes are, are adequate overall. Especially with high demand stock, this can become a problem. You can see that really in terms of dry matter intake here, you know, we might have young growing stock that are looking for you know, two, two and a half percent intake, even higher if we're achieving really high growth rates. And here you can see that say for a 400 kilo animal, pasture digestibility below 70% will start to impose some restrictions on the dry matter intake of that animal. Now that's not necessarily a problem on its own, but it just means that we need to be aware of it because we may then have to come in with some supplementation to ensure that our daily energy and protein requirements are met. So other things to be aware of in terms of dry matter intake is certainly that very high moisture content feed can potentially limit dry matter intake as well. So at the other end of the spectrum, it's something to be aware of when you've got very short, generally green, high moisture content feed. Sometimes stocks struggle to get enough in. If we move on to talking about energy and protein, you'll start to see that there's a wide range in terms of the requirements that are published. This is one table, and it's, and it's from the More Beef from Pastures website that David put a reference up to earlier. And it goes to show you the differences in terms of energy and there's also protein on the right hand side of the screen there across different classes of stock. Now the energy figures that are published here show you the energy requirements in terms of megajoules of metabolizable energy per day. You'll start to see that as the requirements of these animals or the demand of these animals increases, 
with pregnancy and lactation, we actually have fairly significant increases in energy demand. And this is why sometimes we have these limitations on energy intake with these animals, especially if you look at a scenario where we're going into a system where feed quality is declining, intake potential is declining, and the energy intake overall will start to fall away. So it is important to be aware of this in that if we don't start to meet these requirements, then we're going to start seeing that the condition of these stock has fallen away. This is start, starting to become important in terms of how you assess the supplements that are, that are available because in these sorts of situations, if you can clearly determine that we've actually got an energy deficiency in front of these stock, then going out with you know, a small mineral supplement is going to make very, very little difference to the overall um, effect of these animals at all. In terms of protein, it's the other main core component towards nutrition. And in this sort of aspect, we're really looking at trying to provide a protein source to ensure that those rumen microbes are actually surviving and digesting the feed that's coming in. Now, once again, you can see that the protein requirements vary quite a bit across the classes of stock. And in some cases with younger stock, if we're looking to grow them out at faster rates, the protein requirements are even higher than what's published there as well. So the important aspect or the take home message of how to use this practically is we've got to be able to know what the pasture quality is like that's in front of these stock. So that gives us something to be able to compare to these requirement tables to determine whether stock are doing okay or whether they're potentially deficit in a deficit position. So there are some average figures around that you'll be able to find published online that will give you a gauge as to what the feed quality might be like at certain or different stages of um, senescence or the growth stage of that pasture as well. And they will typically show you what levels of energy or what levels of protein you'd expect in a different type. And as you can well imagine, that will vary quite a bit depending on the type of pasture, its stage of growth, uh, the soil nutrition that's available to it, the environment, the season, lots of factors come into play. So if you're looking to get an accurate measure of this, you can also take samples and get them tested by laboratory. And they'll provide you with what the exact energy and protein content of the feed is you know, when you tested it. And that's a, not a bad strategy to take, even if you do it across one or two or three representative paddocks, just to get a gauge as to how the quality is going that season. And once you understand that, you will very quickly be able to determine whether the stock need any supplements for energy or protein. It will also help to give you a bit of a guide as to whether there's any limitations to intake because it should give you back some figures for fibre and also the dry matter content can help provide some, some guidance on that as well. In terms of looking at minerals and vitamins, this is probably one of the areas where we get a lot of products thrown at us. Okay, they vary hugely. Some of the products that are available on the market you know, come in injectable forms, loose licks, blocks, um, boluses. There's plenty that are there that can uh, help in terms of addressing mineral, mineral deficiencies. One of the most important aspects of this is being able to know for certain what deficiencies exist across your farm so that you can determine whether a particular supplement or not is worthwhile. Once again, it comes back to knowing what your deficiencies are and then you'll be able to clearly say whether you need a particular product or not. What often happens is that we don't have much information on whether you have a, you know, a cobalt or a selenium or um, zinc problems, whatever it is. And then what tends to happen is that we go out with a fairly broad spectrum mineral mix. Okay? And like I said, it might be in loose leak, it might be in block form or you know, an injectable at a particular point in the year. One of the simplest things that you can do in terms of starting to get a bit of a gauge as to what deficiencies exist on your farm is once again looking at your pasture tests. Whenever you get a sample, a pasture sample tested, you can always get it analysed for minerals as well. And that's one way of starting to get a good gauge as to whether there's any issues with minerals that need to be addressed on your farm. 
I tend to prefer that these pasture tests are done over things like uh, bloods and livers because they give you the full spectrum of minerals to be able to look at. One of the things with mineral nutrition is that there are lots of inf uh, interrelationships between minerals that mean that just because you might have an adequate level of one mineral doesn't necessarily mean that there's no deficiencies. Sometimes if you have higher levels of other minerals, they will influence and decrease the availability of others. So it's important to understand how they relate to each other and look at some of the ratios of these different minerals to work out whether there's going to be problems or not. And sometimes with bloods, they won't show those sorts of relationships up either. So plant tissue tests can be a really effective way at actually getting a fairly quick look at what's going on on the farm. Now once again, the mineral content of pastures will vary depending with the type of plant and also the time of year and season that you're having. So it does pay to do a few of those samples over the course of the year and then you'll have a pretty good understanding as to what's deficient and where and when. The old maps that say this, you know, a big region of Australia here along the east coast or wherever it is is cobalt deficient and then this strip over here is selenium deficient are starting to really fail now. We're finding that with people's different trace element applications with different liming um, applications, we're releasing different nutrients. So we're finding that there's lots of variation in the mineral profiles of different farms. So it does pay to actually have a look at how some of these function on your own place. Once you know really what the deficiencies are that are existing in your place, it becomes a very easy answer to be able to work out what's going to be the most appropriate or particularly the most cost effective treatment option. With many of these minerals, you've got lots of different options that can treat it. It comes down to working through what's going to be the most cost effective. So my biggest recommendation is really, particularly in terms of minerals, is to find out what the deficiencies are on your property because then you can very, very simply work out which product is going to address it. And it might be that it's far more cost effective to simply make up a small custom batch that will address the problems that you've got on your place. Or you might find that it only takes a particular uh, treatment. So instead of using a broad spectrum mineral mix that you might have been using for a while or a block, that it's only a particular injectable that's required at one or two points throughout the year. Okay, and in those sorts of circumstances, you can save a lot of money. Um, a lot of the injectables, and especially the boluses and those sorts of products, are fairly expensive. And there are lots of cases where we found out that those sorts of products aren't needed. And at the worst spectrum, then some of those minerals can actually be toxic. Okay, and at the very least, then what we find with some of those minerals is that they're simply just urinated out again. So you've just wasted some of that money. So there is generally a very, very good cost benefit in terms of actually determining what, what problems may exist and then going from there. Okay. So that's a fairly broad overview of, of some of the really core pieces of nutrition that you need to be aware of. My overarching comments on this is that generally what we find is that the biggest problems that need to be addressed in terms of nutrition are normally relating to energy and protein. And fixing up those core issues in terms of supplementing with things like hay or uh, grain if it's required or sometimes uh, urea or molasses, those sorts of products that actually fix up the energy and protein, which are the major drivers of nutrition, tend to be the ones that get forgotten and yet they're the ones that give the biggest benefit. Certainly if there's severe deficiencies with some of the minerals, they can certainly limit production. But often it's the real core principles of nutrition that get let slip to start with. So one of the things that you can do right away is to start to think about what feed you've got available in the paddock and what is the most limiting nutrient that's available for whatever class of stock, whatever class of cattle you've got on that paddock at the moment. Okay, so it might be that you have some steers that are growing out and at the moment feed quality is likely declining. Okay, so if we see that you know feed's on the way out, it's starting to fall down to say 
you know, nine ME, it might be starting to decline down, the protein's falling to eight to nine percent, then we're likely going to be running into issues where we've got a protein issue, a protein deficiency. With those sorts of growing stock, you know, we're looking at at least 10, 11, 12 percent protein just to putting on some growth and we're trying to maximise it, it's going to be higher than that, you know, we're talking about 13 to 14 percent. So in those sorts of situations, addressing that protein deficiency is going to have a far greater effect than, you know, putting out the latest block that's been slapped on the market or giving them an injection as they come through the race for weighing next time, or whatever it is. That core principle of identifying what is the most limiting nutrient will always take you the furthest. Once you understand that, once you've assessed it, you can start to look at what options are available. And with all of these things, there's lots of options. You know, if you're looking at a protein supplement option, then there's things like obviously legume haze, you might have some silages that have got higher protein content, there's um, grains that you might look at, there might be cottonseed in some areas. And there's obviously urea that starts to come in as well as options in these places. So it's then a case of talking with someone to go through what's the cost benefit of each of those. And one of the last points is to make sure that you actually incorporate what some of the long-term gains are. Because with all of these decisions, yes, you can make the, the cost benefit based off then and there, what's the result. But if you look at the scenario that we were talking about in terms of actually achieving high growth rates in steers that are growing out, then if they're off quicker, then potentially there's opportunities in terms of carrying cows in better condition or more cows and those sorts of things start to feed in as well. And that's where some of the big gains can actually be made as well. So don't forget about how sometimes those sorts of aspects might, might come into play at the same time. So we're just about at eight o'clock. My real key messages for tonight are that in terms of trying to necessarily beat the marketing spin, it's about understanding where the stock are at, what their requirements are, and importantly, what are their major, major limitations to production. If you know that, then you'll be able to say yes or no to whatever offer you've got or whatever product that you might be looking at. You've got to be able to understand what the nutritional requirements of those stock are before you're going to have any chance of being able to say no confidently to, to something that might be on the market. If you understand those nutritional requirements, then it'll be very, very easy to say, no, look, that doesn't fit right at this moment, or yes, that's perfect for what we need right now, that's going to give us our greatest gain. Okay, so all of those sorts of strategies will help. Make sure that you understand what the quality in the paddock is like, make sure you understand the requirements of the stock, and then you can understand how much product is required and what the cost benefit's going to be. So I think we'll probably leave it there. We've pretty well just hit eight o'clock now. Um, I'm happy to, to take some questions and we can sort of go through some of those at the moment, but I hope that's sort of given you a broad overview of, of the process in terms of working through assessing what products will fit in your system and which won't. Okay, there's lots out there and that overview or that process will help a lot. All right, David, I think I'll leave it there. Great. Thanks, Hamish. That was a, a very concise and informative presentation. Now, guys, Hamish is going to stay on the line for as long as we need to answer your questions. I can see there's a few coming through there, and Hamish might be able to find his question pane and start uh, reviewing those questions as I'm talking. Uh, Hamish, you'll find most, most of the stuff up front is... Uh, just uh, comments, but all the questions are at the bottom of your question pane. Now, again, uh, thanks for participating in tonight's webinar, and obviously you're welcome to sign off now if you wish. If that's the case, please take two minutes to complete the post-webinar survey that will pop up when you close the webinar window. It's really important to us, and we appreciate your time in doing so. On the other hand, for those who wish to stay around and, and ask a few questions, and listen to the answers to questions of, of fellow participants, so I encourage you to, to do so. Um, I know Hamish has got a lot of knowledge there and this is a good forum to, to pick his brains uh, for the improvement of your beef operations. Um, before we go on, like I just want to uh, make mention that we do have an additional webinar next Thursday and it's only just been organised, so a lot of you may not be aware that it's available. If you're interested in beef marketing, that's what the webinar is about. 
and you're welcome to jump online at the same website as you've registered for the other more beef from pasture web, uh, webinars and you can take a look at the detail of the, of the webinar and register if you wish, wish. So Hamish, how are you going there? Have you had the chance to have a look at your questions coming through? Yeah, I think I can see them here. It's pretty narrow, but I can read them one line at a time. So one of the questions here is uh, relating to, there's actually a couple of relating to feed testing laboratories. And, okay, actually it's dropped me down at the bottom. Yeah, you can you can pull your box sideways either way. We, we can't see it on your screen, so you're safe to make it as big as you need. No problems. Uh, look, one of the questions is is asking about labs. There's a number of accredited labs that are available across Australia. There's there's labs in in most states. Um, probably one of the best things to do is just to jump onto Google and search for feed test laboratory, you know, Australia or your state, and you'll you'll probably pop up with a few that way. Um, off the top of my head, there's there's a few. I hope I don't miss any, but um, certainly we've got you know SGS in Queensland do testing. Um, New South Wales DPI, I've got a lab at Wagga feed test, uh, one of the um, well-known ones in Victoria. Um, I think there's APAL in South Australia, there's um, some in WA, um, and there's also quite a number of other sort of labs that have popped up, um, particularly with hay testing, but they're starting to expand some of their capabilities to, to do pastures as well. Um, uh, there's also another lab at Hamilton that's available in Victoria. So, yeah, probably the best thing is just to do a bit of a quick search online and you will find what's available. There was a question around um, whether there's labs that can do the, um, uh, the pasture testing as well as uh, soils and buds at the same time. Uh, yes, some of these labs do have the capability to do all together. Um, in terms of being able to assess them all, all at the same time. It's not critical in that often the labs that can do them um, as one service you know, have different divisions and those sorts of things. So it's not necessarily that they'll um, link them and provide you the outputs like that. And if you go or you make sure that you're actually using an accredited laboratory, most of these labs are involved in some sort of testing that actually links them together. Okay, that's what they often call ring testing, which um, they'll have consistent samples that they have to be able to return values within a certain confidence range. So um, provided you're using a, an accredited lab, then the results are, are fairly accurate and we can, we can generally use fairly standard uh, reference ranges to, to work through any issues that way. Uh, there's a question there about uh, accuracy of soils as well. Look, I tend to find that soils uh, a reasonable indicator where you've got fairly, you know, glaring deficiencies. Where it becomes more marginal, it's not that they won't give you the best gauge. So that's why I tend to find that plant tissue tests are a slightly more accurate way of doing it. You know, it's essentially what the stock are taking in, rather than trying to infer it from, you know, soil, which is then, you know, then the plants absorb the nutrients and then the stock are taking the plants. So. Yeah, I tend to prefer the plant tissue tests. Um, let's have a look at another question. Sorry, just scrolling through. Uh, if there are mineral deficiencies in the soils or pasture, rather than using a liquor injection. Oh, okay, there's a comment there about are we... Um, okay, so there's more of a comment here about uh, if we're finding mineral deficiencies in the soils and pastures, um, rather than using liquor injections, are we underestimating applications of elements with fertiliser? Uh, look, I think um, the trace element applications that we are seeing going out in fertiliser can certainly help in terms of improving the uh, mineral profile of some of these pastures. 
depending on how you apply it, then it changes how long it's going to be within that soil and also the different minerals obviously are retained for different times in the soil as well. So it varies a little bit as to what becomes a more cost effective option to treat. With some minerals, certainly soil applications can help address issues, but with others we tend to find that at the rates that you're putting on, it still doesn't tend to correct issues from the animal's point of view. And that's an important aspect to keep in mind is that often when we're assessing soils and even sometimes when agronomists are looking at plant tissue tests, their classification of what is deficient is generally relating to the plant growth, not what is required from an animal production point of view. And often what we find is that sometimes the animal requirements are slightly lower. So sometimes we'll be classing um, soils or plants deficient based on the pasture productivity, but from an animal point of view, they might be more than adequate. And sometimes that presents some issues and you need to find a bit of balance between um, them not causing issues with animal productivity, but that creates a little bit of discussion between agronomists and, uh, and the livestock advisors. Uh, are there any independent labs? We talked about that. How often should pasture feed tests be done and what's the cost? Um, feed tests in terms of pastures should be done, I tend to recommend if you can do them three times over a year, then that gives you a good gauge. And the timing of that for me is generally post break, once you've started to get some fresh growth occurring with that plant. The second time I like to get a sample is once it's starting to go up to head, you know, once it's starting to, to go reproductive. And then the third time that I like to get a sample is once it's dried right out and senescent. If you can get those three periods, then you'll cover yourself in terms of how the minerals change over the course of the year. Um, and likewise, if you can collect samples from some representative areas of the property, if you have large changes in soil type, for example, then we'd expect to see some differences in minerals that way as well. So be aware of that and, and whether that might change um, how many samples you take at the same time. These tests generally cost um, around $50 to $80 to get the minerals and then it might be about another sort of $40 or $50 to get, to get the nutritive value on top of that if, if you need that at the time. So typically you're looking at, at uh, anywhere from, from sort of $50 to $120 a sample depending on, on how much you want to get done, whether you want minerals or the feed value or both. That's the typical costs that are involved. Okay. Okay, in terms of interpreting those results, uh, look, that's a case of then um, if you don't have the knowledge on that area, then you probably need to find someone who can help talk you through what those different mineral results mean, whether they're inside or outside of, of our target ranges. And if they're not, then if they're outside of those ranges, then it's a case of, of working through those questions around how many minerals are different, what are the best um, options for, for correcting those, and if we've got a few options available to us, what's going to be the most cost effective one? And, and even, you know, and generally I do find that correcting some of these mineral deficiencies is worthwhile. Like I said, the energy and protein issues are normally at the core, but where we start to get down to issues of fixing mineral problems, it normally does pay, but it's worth running the scenario to see what sort of production gain we're going to, we're going to achieve, because occasionally it might work out that it's actually not worth the effort and cost of actually correcting that problem if you're not going to achieve a big production gain. If it's a very marginal deficiency, if it's a very seasonal deficiency, there might be other ways of getting around it in terms of your grazing management or pasture mix. Um, but where there's a severe deficiency, then quite often it's, um, it's fairly cost effective to correct. How many pasture samples would be needed to give a useful, reliable information? Um, one of, the, one of the things to keep in mind is really what your objective for those pasture samples are. So if you are looking to collect a pasture sample to assess feed quality at the time, 
then you need to have a think about how many different types of feed are we dealing with. So if there's a big range in the pasture types that we're looking at that stock are going to be going on to, then you might need to take a few different samples to get a gauge as to what the quality of each of those are. If they're all fairly similar, then you might be able to get away with, with one. And likewise, if you've got a couple of paddocks that are all next door to each other with all the same feed type, you might actually collect a bulk sample across those. Um, we touched on the mineral side in terms of if you're testing for minerals, how many you might need to do, so we've talked about that aspect as well. In terms of reliability, collecting the samples is one aspect of that. So if you are, say, collecting a, paddock, uh, a sample from one paddock, then you need to work your way across that paddock and collect a number of samples as you go across. Normally what I do is, is you might go across onto the diagonal of the paddock and you stop at, you know, say, five or eight or ten different places and collect a small amount of, of feed, bag it up, and then that whole sample goes off to the lab. Effectively, what the lab will do is they'll take everything that's in that bag and analyse a whole lot. So you've got an average of the paddock that's, that's been tested. One of the other aspects, particularly if you're looking to test for feed quality, is that think about what the stock are going to be eating. If you're really concerned about working out what the quality is now for the next you know, couple of weeks, then there's no point getting a lot of feed in the sample bag that the stock aren't going to be eating straight away. So think about what's palatable, think about what the stock are going to be consuming to start with, and you might predominantly put those sorts of parts of the plant into the sample bag for analysis. Uh, there's a question here about urea and how it's used as a protein supplement. Okay, so urea is essentially a, a protein supplement. That nitrogen in the urea can be utilised by the microbes in the rumen to provide an, an additional protein source. With ruminant nutrition, what we're primarily dealing with for protein is that it's the microbes themselves that are actually digested and provide the protein to the animal. So the protein that the animal is taking in in, in terms of feed or a supplement is actually supplying protein for the microbes. The microbes then uh, reproduce, they grow, they, their population grows, and it's those microbes that actually are then passed through down further into the digestive tract and absorbed as proteins, as amino acids. So urea, which is you know nitrogen, is a source of protein for those microbes, so they, they love that. Now, there are maximum inclusion rates that you need to be aware of with urea. It can certainly be very toxic if the rates are too high. So be aware of that. Um, generally, we're looking at you know trying to limit urea to, to a maximum of 1% of the diet. Now, that will vary depending on, on what feeding you're doing. Um, you'll often see that with things like blocks, they might have a higher urea percentage in the block, but because it's a relatively small percentage of the overall diet, they can start to get away with it. So it can be an effective supplement, and it's most effective where energy is not limiting. So if there are issues, if there's not enough energy in the diet at all, then just putting in a protein supplement, particularly in the form of urea, will not have a big effect. But where there's adequate energy out in the paddock, so often urea works well, where we have um, very dry feed that's going off, then you know, protein's declined, and particularly in um, probably seasons, not so much like this, but in seasons where we've had lots of, lots of rain, we've got lots of bulk, lots of dry feed, then protein's normally lower. So that additional protein that's coming in as urea can help those rumen microbes uh, function, can help increase the populations of, of those rumen microbes. And in doing that, what happens is that we increase the rate of digestion of feed that goes in. And when you increase that rate of digestion, what also happens is the rate of intake goes up. So you tend to find that those stock will eat more of that dry feed at the same time, which is something to be aware of. Uh, can you enlarge on pasture testing? I think we've talked about that. Is it basically the same as when we get our silage tested? Yes, pretty much exactly the same. Okay, So with all of these um, tests, it's the same process. The labs can use slightly different methods for different types of feeds, but it's the same process as, 
as getting a hay test, the same process or the same sort of testing as a silage or if you send off grains to the lab, so the same sort of thing. The only difference can be that agronomists will sometimes use a slightly different plant tissue testing method. From an agronomist's point of view, particularly with cropping, sometimes they'll take uh, the first emerged leaf or some factors like that. So that can be different because what we're doing from a nutritive value point of view is actually taking all of the feed that we're expecting those stock to eat, not just the first emerged leaf or some of those components that are more important from an agronomy point of view. But yes, in terms of is it similar to the silage test that you get back and that sort of process and the results? Absolutely. You'll typically get things like the dry matter content, the energy, the protein, the NDF, ADF, uh, digestibility, those figures will, will typically come back on a pasture test plus minerals if you request it. Uh, any recommendations on where the best tests are done? We touched on some of the labs that are available there, so that's good. Hi Hamish, hello. Is there any links between soil and plant tissues to blood testing of animals grazed in that country? Okay, so I touched a little bit on the, on the soils to plants. Look, we've actually done uh, quite a bit of testing in relation to this and, and especially um, we've actually had some research projects on the go around copper in particular and, and not just for copper but in minerals more broadly. Like I said earlier, at the very most you tend to find that if there are severe deficiencies showing up in soils, it's likely that you'll see them in plant tissue tests, but it's not accurate enough that you can uh, say that because the soil test is X, the plant tissues are going to be Y. And likewise, the mineral levels that are in the plant tissues are not a perfect indicator of what you'll see in the blood tests. Be aware that because, and, and, and that's partly because uh, stock will selectively graze different plants, and also bloods can be accurate for some minerals, but they're not accurate for all. Because in some, with, with respect to some minerals, the animal will try and maintain a fairly stable level of that mineral in the bloodstream at all times. And sometimes it's that it's not until the animal is completely depleted that you'll start to see effects in the blood. So in that circumstance, you might have that you know all the animals come back with adequate levels in the blood, but they're borderline, and that you start to see them falling down later on. Whereas that's one of the reasons why I tend to prefer to have a look at some plant tissue tests because it gives you the relative levels. It shows you whether you are you know, on the borderline, whether you're adequate or whether you're severely deficient and, and issues need to be looked at. And like I alluded to a little bit earlier, the tissue test can also start to show you some of the interrelationships between minerals and whether we're dealing with a, a primary deficiency, that is, you know, whether the mineral itself is just severely deficient, and copper is a good example of this, you might have that the copper levels are simply deficient on their own. Or it might be that we have high levels of moly or sulphur or iron, which can all influence the availability of that copper and still result in a deficiency that way as well. So the treatment of those two things can be different as well. So it is important to get a bit of a feel for whether there's just a straight problem or whether there's some interrelationships that we need to be aware of at the same time. Uh, is it important to find an independent lab to avoid the marketing spin of a particular product? Uh, yes, is, is the short answer to that. If they're still accredited, um, but they've got a particular product that goes along with it or something like that, then provided they're accredited, the results should still be accurate and then it's up to you as to whether you um, believe the information that's necessarily coming with it that might be you know, promoting a particular product that suits it. Um, I guess the, the, the crux of that is to ensure that whatever lab you use is accredited and is providing accurate results and then you can take or leave the, uh, the advice that comes with it as you like. Uh, can you comment on the economic benefits of using straw during periods of green feed, e.g. winter, early spring, crop in a high quality pasture for weight gain of cattle? So there's a few issues when you're looking at that very green lush feed and, and like we're sort of alluding to this question, some of the issues are relating to simply the high moisture content of that feed and also 
the low fibre content. So what tends to happen is that with straw, in theory, it's, a, it's an ideal um, product to be putting out in that situation because it provides a dry feed, it provides a fibrous feed, and it also provides a lower protein feed, which is probably the third issue with, with, with those sorts of feeds, and that we're dealing with excess protein generally in the system. You know, we typically might be talking about anywhere from 20 to 30, and you know, I've seen proteins come back at sort of 35 to 40 at sometimes percent, where we've got um, pastures or crops that we're grazing. And that's you know, far in excess of the requirements of cattle, and we want to be able to, to provide a feed that will balance that feed. Okay, so it's about dealing with those things we talked about before, the moisture, the protein, the fibre. So straw in theory is a, is a very good fit for that. Now if stock will eat it, then it can help. Um, my experience is that they don't always eat it. Sometimes they will, but quite often it's not particularly palatable at that time. Um, they don't need much is the other aspect of that. So even if they're not going through a hell of a lot of it, it's not necessarily a big problem. You don't want them consuming huge amounts of straw at that point either because it is such low quality feed. We don't want a large percentage of the diet being that feed because it will then start to impact on things like growth rate. Um, in terms of the economics of it, I do tend to find that with straw or even some poorer quality, say pasture hay or poor cereal hay, that there are some benefits to be achieved there and typically the costs, the benefits outweigh the costs in those scenarios because we'll pick up you know, some weight gain in stock. Um, for say other classes of stock, then it's generally not as big a problem. Sometimes those high protein feeds can create some issues with dystocia in cattle. If you're experiencing those sorts of issues in your, in your herd, then it can be worthwhile looking at, but you know, there's also other issues there that need to be probably addressed um, or at least looked into in terms of you know, minerals and, and whether there's any issues with hypercalcemia or other stuff that's start, starting to come into play. So you need to just probably look at the whole situation. But yes, in, I do tend to find that providing a, a feed that will help balance that really uh, wet, low fibre, high protein feed pays, pays very well, particularly for growing stock. Uh, next question, in assessing the efficacy of supplements, how regularly should I look to assess the results, e.g. weight gain or blood tests once the supplements have been given? So in terms of that question, it starts with, so in terms of assessing how effective that product has been, certainly measuring the animal performance, if you can, is, is the best way of determining uh, how effective it is in treating that problem. That's the most accurate way, or yeah, the most accurate way of being able to determine a cost benefit or not. At the end of the day, a lot of the tests that we do, the plant tissue tests, all those factors are a good way of, of getting a very good estimate and good indication of whether there's issues. But ultimately, you know, the best way to determine whether there's mineral deficiencies problems is to do a treatment trial. Um, that's a lot of work and it doesn't tend to happen, but if you are putting out a supplement and you can do some measurements to actually record what sort of benefits you're seeing, that's brilliant. Okay? And often it doesn't happen, but if you can do it and it works in your system, definitely have a look at it. Ensure that if you're going to be doing that, that you're able to assess it properly, in that you're not comparing you know, a treated mob to an untreated mob that's on the other side of the farm or you're just comparing it to, you know, the production that you remember five years ago or something like that. You know, we've got to be able to actually accurately assess how the production gain has been achieved. But typically, you know, if, if we're seeing serious issues coming up through plant tissue tests or some of these other measures, then, you know, we'll be seeing those, those gains coming through once the animals are actually corrected whether that's for minerals or whether it's also for things like energy and protein problems in assessing that. Uh, if, so I've got a question, if the major limiting factor for cows in late pregnancy is energy and protein, which is more important and the more cost effective? My knowledge is grain will meet the energy requirement, not sure of the protein requirement. 
but is meeting the energy requirement enough? Okay, so yes, certainly in late pregnancy there's an increase in demand for energy and protein. In terms of the role of those, very broadly speaking, energy has a big effect in terms of keeping condition on, on stock. Okay, if you have a high energy intake, typically you'll, you'll find the condition or fat score of those stock will increase. Protein broadly has a, has a role in terms of growth, putting on muscle mass. Obviously also it has a role in milk production. It's also important in terms of sperm production for bulls. So in that period of late pregnancy, energy is a really important component. And, and to my mind, if you've got to pick one or the other, I'd be looking at really making sure that energy is looked after. Protein requirements are still increased a little bit because we still want to support that growing calf. But it's not until that, graph hit, that, that calf hits the ground that the protein requirements really start to skyrocket. And that's to support milk production more than anything. So supplying energy is primarily through, you've identified grain there, so we're talking generally about a cereal grain as an energy supplier. Legume grains tend to supply energy and protein. Now, how much and what supplement suits best depends really on what their base feed is. So I'm not sure when your calving time is or what the feed's like, but you know, if we're talking about more dry feed that those, those cows are going to be on, then we're probably looking at coming in with, with predominantly um, some energy supplement, but potentially also a small amount of protein would be beneficial as well. If we're looking at a later calving period of spring calving, chances are there's more than enough protein coming into the system and we really want to be making sure that energy is addressed. So that would be one of the major ones. Hay can have a role in these situations, but you tend to use quite a bit simply because of the fact that the, the energy content is comparatively lower to things like your grains. Um, also, in terms of looking at those options, be aware of, of what the moisture content of the feed is and what the moisture content of the supplement is. Now, I think when you're on really wet feed, um, particularly for sort of winter and spring periods, I don't tend to prefer to then go out with, say, a, a silage that, that might have been made last season. You know, in those sorts of situations, a dry feed tends to work better. So that's part of it as well. If not deficient, does that mean animals should be getting everything they need in terms of minerals and trace elements? Uh, not necessarily is the short answer to that. I think we've touched on that a little bit today. At weaning, it is often suggested that pasture be supplemented with hay and protein supplements. Do the principles of energy and protein still apply to keep calves' condition going forward? Uh, yes, is the short answer. Absolutely. So, in terms of, of weaner calves, uh, it's about understanding what the base nutrition available in the paddock is. So what's the energy protein content of, of that feed, how does that compare with the requirements of those calves, is there a deficit that we need to address. So if there isn't, no point going out with extra feed. If you find that there's a small energy problem, then we might go out with an energy supplement. Or like you say, if there's a, a protein problem, you might be going out with a protein supplement as well. So. Typically those recommendations in terms of putting out hay and protein supplements are driven towards that. The hay is generally recommended in terms of trying to provide an energy source and the protein supplements are obviously towards protein. Um, once again, it depends a little bit on, on your timing and, and what your paddock feed's doing, but the same principles apply in terms of going through that process of what's the quality that's available in the paddock, what's the requirements of the animal, how does it align. The stress and those sorts of factors that start to kick in, if you're providing adequate energy and protein in the diet, it's not going to be a huge benefit to provide extra. They're simply not going to get a huge benefit out of that. There are other things that start to come into play. You know, there's supplements that, that can provide magnesium that helps with stress and there's also some of those electrolyte products and all those sorts of things. The effectiveness of all those different products varies hugely um, and especially depending on the timing. So, so have a chat with someone that you trust about how they might fit at that weaning time as well. But essentially, if you can keep the stress down on those stock and providing enough energy and protein in the diet, things tend to look after themselves fairly well. Uh, 
Uh, did the labs provide target ranges? No, generally not. Some do, but on the whole, they don't. Uh, do you recommend blood tests to find out if they are deficient? I think we've touched on that enough. I've uh, talked about that. When the feed changes from wet to dry and vice versa, how long does it take for the microbes to adjust? Is this a critical time to supplement? Um, in terms of that change, look, there's certainly an adaptation period that occurs within the room, and typically you're looking at at least two weeks. There are some there is some work that's actually suggesting that some of those changes can take up to six weeks at times. But I think generally, if you keep in mind that where you're having a sudden change, and particularly where you might be um, restraining stock or containing stock in some paddocks to let you know green feed get away, then you're going to have a couple of weeks period there where the stock are adjusting to that change in feed type. Typically, if it's just changing on its own, you know, the feed in the paddock is, is gradually changing itself. The stock tend to look after themselves fairly well that way. But it's about making that change reasonably gradual. You've got um, the most sudden is typically going dry to, to, to green. One of the things that you can do there, if they're going out onto a paddock that is uh, all fresh, lush green feed, then try and make sure that you can provide some dry, higher fibre feed. So whether you've got some hay that you might be able to provide to keep, to keep roughage in the dye, that works well. But likewise, if there's still some old residual dry feed in the paddock, then they'll tend to access that and, and look after themselves that way. Um, vice versa, critical time to supplement. So yes, it, it is an important time to supplement, but if that change, like I say, is occurring over a couple of weeks, it's probably not too much of an issue. If it's a sudden change, definitely something worth considering in terms of supplementing. Also, be aware of any health issues that might present in that time as well. That's another key um, time when you can have issues with, with things like pelvic kidney or bloat. So those sorts of sudden changes uh, sit us for those. So just be aware that um, that's sometimes what drops stock more so than the, uh, the change in feed type. Okay, David, I reckon unless there's any more questions, we'll leave it there. Great, thank you Hamish. It seems to be the last of the questions coming through and, and we've had a, we've had quite a few tonight. Uh, beef nutrition always seems to generate a fair bit of interest and you've done a great job in answering them very methodically and uh, with uh, some very considered responses. Uh, so Hamish, I, I can't see any more questions coming through, so I might, I might thank you very much for presenting for us today and I thank everyone else for attending today's webinar. Obviously, if you have further queries for Hamish, you can contact him at AgriPartner. His contact details are on the slide at the moment. If you fail to take those details and you contact uh, us, the More Beef and Pasture State Coordinators, we'll be happy to pass you through to Hamish. If you have more questions about the More Beef and Pastures program, obviously contact us again at Home Sackett. We're more than happy to consider uh, your queries and um, even the potential to run More Beef and Pasture funded pro program uh, projects in your area. So if there's any of those take, uh, take your fancy, please be in touch. Again, please take a few minutes to complete the post webinar survey. It's really important for us, and and more. I know MLA want the producers' feedback uh, to help them drive their research, development, extension into the future. So, once again, on behalf of the MLA-funded More Beef and Pastures program, our presenters, and all you guys out there for joining us today, thank you and have a great evening.